chat. And if you are in the like, I'm building it stage of your telehealth practice, put two, just so I can see where you are. Okay. Keep them coming, keep them coming. Come on, there's more of y'all here. I know you're probably eating your lunch. Okay, yeah, 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 I can repeat it, Zachary. So if you already have a telehealth practice and you're here just to make sure your I's are dotted and T's are crossed, put one. If you are starting your practice and you need to know all the things, put two. Cool, 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 cool. Okay, good. All right, so last time I have felt a little overwhelming for those of you just starting. And I tell you what, like I've been teaching it for so long and every time I teach it, I'm like, man, there are a lot of freaking details to have to think through, you know, like you get farther away from that starting point and you forget that you had to think of all of those small things. So mad respect to those of you who are coming back just to do a little uh, loving audit of your practice, because, you know, it's a lot of details and we kind of forget how much we thought through. And I'm going to say that in a reassuring way, too, for those of you just starting out. It can feel overwhelming for maybe the first two months where you're having to think through a lot of stuff, but then it's over and everything is set up already. You know, do you remember the first time you went to the bank and set up a bank account and it felt like such a big deal and it was so overwhelming, right? Or learning to write, drive a car or write a check or any of those things. But once you did it, it's done. And now you know how to do it forevermore. So that's what we're focused on. Here's another little caveat. Um, how many of you, hands up, are a little risk avoidant? You know, you just rather not take on extra risk. You want to do things right. You want to make sure you do not get in trouble. You want to make sure that you're protecting your clients, right? And there are a couple ways that this shows up. Number one, it can make you hyper attentive to details, sometimes to the point of paralysis. Or it can be so overwhelming that you're like, screw this, I'm not thinking about it. I'm just going to work for an agency or a tech company or you know somebody else who can take charge of all these details. So I want to share with you the danger in that second part because I want you to really, really try to stay attached to the outcome of setting this up yourself in a legally ethical and blah, blah, blah sound way. So you may work for a tech company, an agency, a amazing boss at an amazing company. But ultimately, if some ish goes down, you are the one responsible. And I've told this particular story a number of times. So I apologize if you've heard it before, but I had this amazing job. I absolutely loved where I was working. Everybody was super on top of their game. My boss was awesome. I had a client ask me to give her her records. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I never really thought about having to give over the records. You know, I was like brand new into being an adult with a license. And so I asked, I went to our policies and procedures manual and it said, give them a summary. Don't give them the records. I was like, okay, cool. I'll do a summary. So I tell her this and she's like, no, 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 no. I don't want a summary. I want the records. I want all of the records. And her rationale when she explained it to me made total sense. Like I got it. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense why you would want them. And so I went to my boss and I was like, so what's the deal? Because it says that we don't give them, um, but she really wants them and it makes sense for her to have them. And, and he was like, yeah, we don't do that. I started feeling kind of funny about it. So I started looking up the state regulations and what the state regulations said in that state was that the records belong to the client, not to the agency. So if she wanted her records she was legally allowed to have her records. So I went back to my boss and he was like, well. <laughs> so ultimately, like I could have been the conduit saying, no, I'm not going to do that. And then I am also the one legally responsible because it's my license. It doesn't matter. I can't say what my boss said or the agency said. Some of you who are working with tech companies and no shade, but they will, yet you need to understand that they do not have the same legal responsibilities that you have as a health provider with your license. So they can set up their policies and procedures that are in line with their regulating bodies, but not yours. And I'll give you a very specific example. If you download the terms and services for therapy clients with some of these tech companies, you will find very clearly articulated breaches in confidentiality, selling of protected health information, 
all that stuff, it's in the terms and services that nobody reads. That's because they are not bound by the same legal stuff that we are bound by because they don't have licenses, not our licenses. So if you go to work for them and you're thinking, well, they've got tons of money, so they must be doing things right. Mm -mm. They're doing things right by their bosses, not by your bosses. Does that make sense? Let me see some head nods. Okay. So when we think about your bosses, remember last time we talked about you have your professional code of ethics, which is aspirational, print that shit out, highlight it. You have your state or your country regulations. And the way that I get these is I write to the board because <laughs> sometimes they're smattered across lots of places. And I say, hi, I'm a licensed psychologist in North Carolina and Florida. Could you please send me the links to all of the regulations that I should be aware of for my practice? And that way I've covered my little booty in email because they've sent me all the links and I can feel for sure that I haven't missed anything. Then I print those and I highlight the crap out of those as well. So I'm going to show you a slide that helped my little neurotic brain a lot. Let's do this. Let's do this. Okay. That's not what I wanted to show you. Let's do this. Here we go. I'm going to go up a slide here. Hold on. We'll get there. Um, yeah. This is what I wanted. All right. So when you're trying to figure out like, what the heck do I need to know? This is the one I want. What the heck do I need to know? These are some of your bosses, right? You've got your ethics. You've got your state regs. You've got best practices. You've got HIPAA. You've got your own morality, right? Your clinical thoughtfulness. I think of reading each of these with an eye towards what does the ethics code say needs to be in my paperwork. What does the state regs say about paperwork? What do best practices say about paperwork? What does HIPAA say about my paperwork? All of that I'm going to highlight in yellow across all those things. Same with emergencies. What is my ethical codes? They don't say anything about emergencies. What do they say about emergencies? What does my state regs say about emergency? What about best practices? Okay. And I just go through every one and highlight in that color. We do this together in the course. So if you're like, holy crap, don't, that's okay. We can do it together. Okay. That way you have the information. So when some rando in a Facebook group is like, that's not ethical, that's not legal. You can say, in what state and what degree type are you speaking of? Could you please cite the code for me? Because I have all this documented in my notebook of awesome and my documents don't say what you're saying. Okay. Okay. So as we're auditing or setting up our practices, we need to think about <clears throat> how does the fact that we're doing telehealth change what we were trained in in graduate school, which for most of us did not involve telehealth. <laughs> so when we think about security, right, and we have a physical practice, the rule was, at least in Florida, you need to have everything between behind two locked doors, right? So a locked closet and a locked file cabinet. How does that match with telehealth? And in telehealth, we're talking about passwords and encryption. So the rule tends to be the same. We need it behind two locked things and having a password on your computer and then a password to get into your EHR. That would work, right? If you have an external hard drive where you keep your information and it's encrypted, you've got a password to get on there and a password to open up each client's documents. That's two locks, okay? So we're just going to use our good sense to make these things comparable for telehealth. Same with paperwork. So if we think about what the intention is in your informed consent, right? Informed consent, we're giving them all the possible information they need to know about the benefits of therapy and the risks of therapy so that they can make an informed decision about whether they want to embark on this process. So that's going to include some extra special things for telehealth, right? So I include things down to nitty gritty kind of like, hey, one of the benefits of telehealth is you might feel even more comfortable in therapy because you're going to be in your own home with your own blankie and your own snuggly pet. And one of the risks of feeling this comfortable is that it can be easy to let this move from a sacred space to a casual space where it feels normal to bring a glass of wine to the therapy session at 7 p.m. because you're comfy cozy, or it feels okay to engage in more like friendship, casual conversation rather than jumping in and really making use out of the session. 
So I will include things even like that in risks and benefits to help orient them to what the process should look like. Okay. I'm going quickly through some of these just to give you examples of each one. Policies and procedures. So telehealth specific, right? For example, somebody brought up last time, what if a client wants to record sessions? So I do not want my sessions recorded for a myriad of reasons. I'm gonna include that in my policies and procedures, most of which live in my informed consent. So when you think about like, oh my gosh, I have to build policies and procedures, my friends, almost all of your policies and procedures are covered in your informed consent. So I'm going to have like, there will be no video recording of our sessions or digital recording, whatever it's called now. Then we have clinical excellence. So how do we make sure that we are connecting with clients via video as well as or better than we would in a physical shared space? So one of the pieces that we talk a lot about in the step-by-step -step course is how to make good eye contact depending on your computer setup, because what you don't want to be doing is like looking like you're looking over here, right? While you're talking to your client, it just feels weird. And you'll notice in sessions when you have found that sweet spot of eye contact, you feel it in your body. Like all of a sudden you're like, oh, <laughs> it feels like we're actually in the same space. So taking time to set that up and letting them know the importance of setting that up, even if it feels weird to spend 10 minutes figuring it out in one of the early sessions so that you can do it going forward. So you might think, okay, cool, I've got all of that. I just wanted to give you like, so we covered one example in each of these, right? But these are all of the examples that we cover in the paid course. So you can take a picture of this if you want, if you just are like, I'm not taking the paid course, but I'd like to brainstorm on this. It's totally okay for you to do that. Take a screenshot, whatever you need to do. I am gonna spend some time on risk stuff. So I'm gonna let that go here. All right, so just to give you a little example with security. So this is part of how the step-by-step -step course is built with worksheets for you to be able to go through and just kind of check off everything that you have. So when we think about security, you're thinking three zones minimally. My computer, which is where we do most of our work, the internet, and then we also usually do some work on our phone. You know, you might have your portal or something on your phone. So is your computer password protected? Or if you share your computer with your family, do you have it segregated so that your side is password protected? Do you have your laptop set up so that if you were to lose it, you could remote wipe it so that all of the data is gone? Okay. These are things that you should be thinking about in the setup process. If you have clients information in folders, are you password protecting each of those folders? Okay. <laughs> Tricky wicket one. And I, if y'all use a backup system, like for example, I have Google Docs or Google Drive backs up all the files on my computer. And I had that set up before I started doing therapy. And it didn't even occur to me in the beginning, like, oh crap, it could be backing up client files into Google Drive, which at that time was not HIPAA compliant. And so then I, you know, went down a YouTube rabbit hole, like, oh crap, how do I make sure to not have it back up these specific files? So we're literally just thinking through the minutia. With internet, we are always using password protected Wi-Fi, always, <laughs> not just open Wi-Fi. And you know, you can look at VPNs which secure your Wi-Fi. Like I travel a lot, so I am going to be in coffee shops working, writing notes, or you know, I might be at an RV camp and there's Wi-Fi. It's password protected, but everybody in the whole RV park has the password. That is not going to be super secure. So in those cases, having your own VPN, which are super cheap now, is a good idea. Now listen to this one. I have to include this in the free training because I. I can't tell you how many screw ups have happened. I tell my clients and it's in my informed consent to turn off all listening devices. I would prefer that they have their freaking phone off because you know that love you Facebook, but you Facebook is listening to all the things, which is why you get those amazing ads because they were listening. I was just no joke y'all watching YouTube videos of, um, gosh, now I'm going to forget the name. It's a, it's about a huge dog. 
Irish wolfhounds. I was watching YouTube videos last night about Irish wolfhound puppies and are they snuggly? Literally my YouTube search. I didn't say anything out loud about it, but Facebook the next day, next day is feeding me ads about Irish wolfhounds. Okay. So your internet is listening and that might not seem like that big of a deal because the internet's listening to lots of things. And you're like, I mean, like <laughs> what are the chances that they're going to give a shit about what's happening in your therapy session and then put it out in the world. But listen, I had a situation where someone had one of those nest cameras and, um, it was on, this person was at somebody else's house doing their therapy session. Didn't think about that. They had nest cameras that the nest cameras were on the nest camera recorded them saying very private things that then this other person was able to listen to, right? Freaking scary stuff. So please make sure that we have conversations about shutting all of this off. It may seem paranoid, but I mean, I have Googled some weird stuff and it's shown up on my Echo grocery list. So, you know, it's just creepy and we don't want our clients' information shared there. Okay, phone. I'm not going to get into the weeds here other than I do want to highlight this one. Um, you know, if you're on your phone and you're in your email, for example, and your client has sent you a document and you open that document in your email on your phone, it is typically saving that to the file section of your phone, which you probably don't have set up to be secure. So I would just set it up to not save anything to my phone, or I wouldn't open documents from email on my phone. And when you open it, like, just think about when you open something on your computer and it goes to the file section or the documents or the download section that can happen with client information. So you just want to be careful about that. All right. And we go into deep dives. You know, these are just like the top of the list for each of these areas. We go into a deep dive on each of these in the course. All right, these are areas that we're gonna adapt for telehealth. So we do adapt our informed consent. We've talked about that. I adapt my um, releases of information and emergency contacts. This could just be total paranoia on my side, but I just think like if I were in a physical office and my client started having a seizure, I would be in the room to at least support them to not bang their head into something. And if the parents are in the house of a client that I'm having a telehealth session with, and they can get there before the ambulance does to protect the client. I just feel like that makes sense to me. So this is part of my scope of practice. I'm going to have to have emergency contacts or it doesn't fit into my scope. Um, we do have to share our HIPAA privacy policy with the client. I linked to that in the course. Uh, you might need to adapt your payment policy. So back in the day when we were all in physical offices, you know, you might give your therapist cash or a check, but we are all accepting money via online payments, which means that we're going to invoice them and send that electronically. And we're going to receive payment electronically. And both of those things contain protected health information and personal identifying information. So doing it through a portal means you're totally cool, you're protected. If you're doing it through email, we need to think about some options together. Um, we talked about, if you guys weren't here yesterday, rewatch the part about the omnibus rule, which allows us to do less secure means of communication with our clients if they so choose and we so choose. We have to give them HIPAA secure options but if they're like, I really don't want to do that. And you're like, I really don't either. They could choose to opt out and do something less secure, but it has to be an option for them to get the most secure. Okay. So I want to highlight here for just a minute, emergency plan for telehealth. When you guys think about, um, <laughs> oh, I got a private question. I have to answer this. How do you handle if a client joins a car with others during a session is not using headphones. Yes. Well, I've had that very thing happen, my friend. Um, there seems to be like a little bit of a generational thing that can happen with telehealth sometimes. <laughs> Y'all are nodding like, yeah. Um, and I think as a stigma of mental health care has gone down, there's more and more of a casualness. You'll see on TikTok, like things my therapist said, you know, and so Setting up from the get-go, the sacredness of the therapy time is very important. 
And I have literally had a client who's chatting away with me on the phone and they're going in to pick up their lunch order that they ordered and their friends are with them. And I'm like, whoa, 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 (laughs) we need to have a talk. So I would just redirect and say, you know, I totally appreciate that this is messaging. I totally appreciate how comfortable you feel with me and with therapy. And that makes me feel great. And I know that if we're going to really make this worth your time and to dig into some important things, we're going to need privacy to do that. So let's go ahead and reschedule for our session. And then we're going to have a deeper talk then during that session. It's so fun to think about how much stigma has changed. I want to recap this very important part. You've heard me say it a hundred times, but you guys, please, please, please set your desired salary and desired hours before you set your fee, set your fee based on this stuff. And then we're going to market to clients who can pay that fee. Okay. This is going to lead you to have a full and whole life and to be a better therapist rather than what I see therapists doing over and over. Take what you're given overwork to make that work. Okay. I'm going to have to see 40 clients a week. Right. And then you end up burnt out. And I would even say, if you happen to be that person that it's hard for you to set boundaries for your own self, I'm going to be manipulative. Okay. I would suggest that if you're a really great therapist and you want to be a really great therapist for a long time, you better take care of yourself because you will burn out in your career. And then you're not going to be a therapist for anybody because you're going to be like, listen, I'm going to work at a nursery. I can't do this anymore. So your boundaries allow you longevity in your career. All right. This is not, I want to get to an emergency part here. Yes. Okay. When we think about online stuff, A couple of the things that get in the way of you feeling safe and secure is your fear about what will happen if there is a clinical emergency. So we've talked a lot about how to protect your practice in terms of security and technology and even scope of practice. But what about when a clinical emergency comes up? Is there a little bit more of a challenge for you in dealing with that? So let me see in the chat if clinical emergencies freak you out at all because it's telehealth or even just because it's solo practice. I mean, that for me, that was the big thing. I was like, I'll figure out the telehealth part, but the solo practice part, like I'm used to going into other people's offices and asking questions. This is a lot of responsibility. Zachary's like, "Mm -hmm, yep, yep. Yeah, which parts, share in the chat, which parts are kind of freaking you out a little bit about managing clinical risk in a telehealth practice? And while you're writing that down, I'm going to address Kat's question, which was, would you then charge the client a canceled appointment fee since it was in your informed consent? And Megan's like, good question. So I think we all have to set up our late cancellation policies to align with our theoretical orientation and the way we run our practice. So I'm kind of down with whatever works for you. In my practice, I've intentionally kept my caseload very small. So I'm seeing, you know, when I was in practice, I'm not right now. I was seeing 12 to 15 clients max a week when I had my practice in its sweet spot. So if somebody canceled, it wasn't a big deal to reschedule them. I had a lot of free time that I could put them into. So I had a late cancellation policy, but I never had to enforce it. So the other piece of that, because my clients really didn't cancel late much of the time because we really talked about the sacredness of the therapeutic space. We really set that tone, right? But the other piece is like as somebody with migraines and other (laughs) issues, health issues, sometimes I would need to late cancel and it didn't feel okay to me to late cancel on my clients and then charge them if they late canceled on me. So it felt like we had a very we were all on the same page, you know, with what the standards were. And if I saw it becoming an issue with a client and it was being abused, then we would have that conversation clinically. And I would have in my paperwork to be able to be like, listen, I haven't charged you. And this feels like it's becoming a thing. So next one's free. But after that, we're going back to the policy. And I would set it up that way. Okay. Not having people in the office to consult on things as they're happening. Yes. 
Uh huh. Knowing where emergency services are near their area if I have to call for them. Yes. So I've seen clients in other countries and in, you know, various parts of various states. And it is really shocking how different the, I'm going to just go with involuntary hospitalizations for now. You know, all the emergency services are different, but it's been really surprising how different they are, even among different counties. So if I was in Palm Beach County in Florida, they have a mobile crisis response unit that is staffed with mental health providers and police officers, and they can literally go to the person's house and do an assessment. But one county over, no such thing existed. And so I would need to be the person that initiated the involuntary hospitalization. I would have to be the person in contact with the unit that they were being taken to. And so I have, <laughs> I'll show you, I'll show you because I'm, I'm pleased with it. Um, in this step-by-step -step course, I'm going to share screen. Nope, this one. There's a whole section on managing clinical risk. And it includes documents like risk to self. And I made this document based on Marsha Linehan's risk assessment based on, um, oh shoot, am I gonna forget his name? It's a dude and he loves to talk with people about their suicidal pain. Ay, ay, ay. And he has a whole risk, of, it's not Kobe, I'll think of it. Anyway, it's based on most of their research um, and then, there's also this piece that can happen where we will involuntarily hospitalize somebody out of our own cover your assness. And even when we think like, oh, I think that this person is gonna be okay, but I feel like I have to cover my butt by putting them in patient. There's been a ton of research to show the other side of what are the resiliency factors of this person? What are the protective factors of this person? So that even if you've got lots of risk factors here, but intuitively, and maybe with some wisdom that's coming from research that you remember from grad school, you believe that they're not at current risk, this other worksheet gives you a list of things you can check off to be able to back yourself up. We also have in here violence towards others, safety plan templates, and how to protect your practice overall. The reason that I wrote all of that stuff out is because in the heat of the moment, if you guys have ever been in one of those crisis situations, your brain is thinking about so many things at the same time that having those documents printed out and available to me, even just as a grounding tool, is super helpful. And so I can have the conversation with the client. It's really irritating me. I CAMS. The CAMS model, the collaborative assessment of something, something, something. Jobs is his name. Oh, thank you, brain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So that would have bugged me late into the night. So it's easier to have a conversation than look at your worksheet and be like, okay, yeah, bam, 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 bam. I checked all of that stuff. Okay, I forgot to follow up on this thing. I don't know if you've ever been in the situation of handling crisis calls, um, and then you got off the call and you went to document it and you were like, oh crap, I didn't ask this question. And it's super important that I asked. And then you have to make that weird, awkward call back, right? <laughs> like, hey, I know we agreed you're safe. I kind of forgot to ask you this one thing, right? So having these documents out can be super duper helpful. Okay, Kat's saying, I get that and personally agree, but then so many people will come in saying other professionals do that, may cancel your appointment by charge if you cancel. I guess that's um, what's best for us, but so many people have their own opinions. They sure do. They sure do. And what's cool is it's your freaking practice. So you get to do it how you want to do it, so long as you communicate it clearly in your informed consent and in the like overt conversation around your informed consent and your consistent. I think those are the really crucial parts. So I wanna pause here to ask about questions. I've been giving you lots and lots of information. Let's pause. What questions, and you can turn on your mic and speak or you can pop it in the chat, whatever you're comfortable with about setting up your online therapy practice ethically, legally, and made for success. What you got? <laughs> Do you feel like you know everything? Is that what's happening? I know, right? <laughs> Bad chance. 
there is a checklist in the step-by-step -step course because I know like right now we're going through a lot of slides and it can feel like, holy majoli, <laughs> there is a checklist. So you can literally be like, did it, did it, did it, did it. And then know that you've covered all of the bases that you need to cover. As I'm waiting for your questions to come in, if you have them, I'm gonna just briefly speak about a slippery slope that happens and I think in private practice period, but also in telehealth, which is the slide towards casualness. Because, you know, we're potentially in our pajama pants. We might be dressed like a professional up top and in pajama pants down below, or our clients might be so comfortable with us that the best place for them to meet with us is from our, their bed, or, you know, you've gotten to know their dogs, they've gotten to know your dogs, whatever things can start to slide into uh, a dangerous casual place. And so I wanna encourage you as private practice owners and as telehealth providers to make sure that you are checking back to your informed consent and all of your policies and procedures pretty regularly. Like once a quarter, just a quick read through of your own informed consent to reorient you back to those values that you have when you set up your practice, because it can be very easy to start to slide, even boundaries with starting five minutes late and then continuing the session five minutes after to make up for the time. These little slides can start to change the dynamic of the relationship with your clients in a way that may not serve you or them over the longer term. Jen says, is, a random question, is there specific adjustment for the eye contact on simple practice? Good question. So let me ask you a question. With simple practice, like with Zoom, for example, I can shrink up the screen so it's taking up like two thirds of my computer. So it's kind of sitting right under my camera, which when I look at you guys, of course my computer isn't set up correctly right now, but typically when I look at my client, it looks to them like I'm looking directly in their eyes because I've been able to move my zoom screen around so that it looks that way. With simple practice, are you able to move the video screen around so that it's situated right under your, your camera? So I'm, <clears throat> hi. <laughs> so I'm used to zoom and I'm not used to simple practice yet. So I don't know if I can answer that. And okay. I think maybe I'm not looking directly at the client. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's a bummer. For me, like that's a, okay. So Jennifer's saying simple practice lets you shrink your video, but it does not let you move your video. Man, I just think that that eye contact is so essential. And <laughs> I mean, it's two pieces, right? You want to be making eye contact with them. And also you need to see their face so that you can see the reactions on their face. So th that feels like for me, it would be a deal breaker. If I can't set it up so that when I'm looking at their face, it looks like I'm looking at their face to them, then I would probably try a different software. I know a ton of people who use simple practice. So maybe there's a workaround that I just don't know about. And if you guys know, feel free to speak up. Other questions about setup or about the course itself? Okay, I'm gonna share some slides about the course like this and like this so that questions can come up if you have them. The barriers that I see with people not getting their practice set up and running, because sometimes it's years in the making, right? is stress about the money or the marketing. Both of those things we cover in the course, you don't have to be slimy salesy in order to market therapy. It's one of the benefits of being in a service oriented field. We just get to do good things out loud and help people out loud and we end up getting clients. The difference between what's in the step-by-step -step course with regard to marketing versus the marketing intensive is step-by-step -step is teaching you all the things with setting up a business, setting up practice. And it's a little piece, a mini course on marketing, whereas the marketing intensive is all marketing. In the very beginning of the course, kind of like I did in this retraining series, you're going to get a, a big, heavy dose of money stuff. So figuring out how much you need to make, how much you're spending, what your 
um, good, better, best financial goals are. All of that stuff happens in the beginning of the course. We talk money issues like money boundaries and also boundaries for your freaking practice. So you don't have to stress about those things. I think some people worry, especially in the past, that they're going to have to compromise their values a little bit to do telehealth. For example, uh, in the very beginning, I had a client that wanted to see me. I wanted to see her, but she really wanted to be seen in an office. And I did not want to have an office, but I have a little tiny bit of a people pleasing part of my personality. And literally, even though I left my jobby job to have a virtual practice, I literally started looking at renting office space to be able to see her. And then I was like, Amber, what are you doing? You are not the only therapist in the world. You do not have to see this person, right? Because I started to, to almost feel like I worried that I would be coercive and be like, no, you have to see me in telehealth right? But she didn't have to see me. So her choices were me with telehealth or somebody else in a physical practice. And ultimately she decided that she would try three sessions of telehealth and see how it felt. And I was like, okay, that seems reasonable. And by the third one, she's like, I will never, ever go back to a physical office again. This is amazing. Right? So, you know, you don't have to compromise your values. You just have to be clear about what your values are and communicate them clearly to others. You do not need to see every client. There are other therapists who really need help filling their practice. Share the wealth. All right. And then the last piece, and this is the most, like the most common obstacle to people having their own practice, telehealth or otherwise, is the fear of messing up or getting in trouble, right? And then you go into a Facebook group and you ask a question and then it's, you know, very strong opinions with shared with no kind of sensitivity whatsoever. So we just want to make sure that you have the support you need, whether it's other clinicians or the step-by-step -step course or me that can answer for you. Am I allowed to do this? And, and which boss do I need to ask to find out if I'm allowed to do this? So you don't have to worry about messing up in a way that's going to get you in big, big trouble. The reality is, is that we will all mess up to some degree, because it's impossible not to, right? The rules change. You know, you have to have started your documentation within 48 hours of seeing the client, but you need to have finished it within six weeks. Like these are difficult things to remember unless we are revisiting those regulations, you know, every year or so to make sure that we're doing what we're, we should do that as a retreat, a virtual retreat. And just like, y'all are like, that sounds so boring, Amber. That sounds really fun to me. Like a two hour block where we all read our state regulations once a year and like go through and make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Oh my goodness. Uh, Miriam says, uh, is the marketing intensive suitable for a group practice? It sure is. Um, and, and I will say this, there is, um, when you're marketing yourself, it's so easy to get the messaging, well, not easy, but it's easier to get the messaging clear about your ideal client because you are trying to attract someone to you. Whereas when you're marketing a group practice, you're doing one of two things. Either your group practice has a very particular vibe and you're marketing that vibe. Like, hey, we treat people with this sort of anxiety, with this sort of approach, with this sort of vibe. Easy peasy marketing. But if you have a group practice with um, people who with different niches or they're more generalist, then we need to market each individual person. And so we'll have a page dedicated to each person. I can get you some templates that you can use with your staff members to bring out of them the copy that's going to work best for their page. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Yes, yes. I know somebody who, and I don't recommend this, but she was mad successful at it. She's an anomaly. She has a group practice for people um, who specialize in treating folks with um, all sorts of different eating disorders, but all, all sorts of different concerns. And her primary marketing vehicle is Instagram, which I think is amazing because Instagram is of course the social media place that people with this sort of condition are likely to go to. She has a huge presence and she brings in enough clients through that social media to fill the entire group practice. That is 
that is a very, very, very unusual situation. Most of us will not market like that. It's more of an influencer style marketing, which, you know, there's all sorts of pros and cons with that, but it's working great for her group practice. So it really depends. Is the practice uh, niched or do we need to focus on each person in the practice? Other questions. Does anyone need links? Because we have the links up at the top, but you may not have been here when those links came in. Oh, I forgot to tell you. So the early bird discount codes, you got seven days and they go away. And you can save either $200 if you're getting step-by-step -step or the marketing intensive, or if you're leveling up to get additional coaching in any of those programs, you can save $400. So please, 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 if you're going to purchase, purchase before that expires. You've got seven days. Um, I feel like there was something else related to that that I was going to tell you, but I forgot what it was. You can save additional monies if you want to pay in full between $150 and $300. Um, if it was me, I'd probably pick the payment plan because it can be six months or 12 months, depending on what you're purchasing. And you can just spread that money out over time. For most of you, it is a write-off in your practice. So just consult with your tax person. You'll get an invoice for this. And in most cases, it's going to be a write-off uh, that you can pull from your taxes. All right, just a few more slides and then we will move to wrapping up. But I'm also here for questions. Uh, Kat, is your question about the difference between step-by-step -step and the marketing intensive or step-by-step? -step? Okay, yeah, okay. Yes, let's talk about it. So they are very different. Step-by-step -step is all about how to build an online therapy practice. So we're making sure your paperwork is on point, that your processes and procedures are in place, that you are not breaking any laws, that you're HIPAA compliant, that you have your business associates agreements with all the people that you're supposed to have that with. LLC, PLLC, S Corp, you know, all of the things of starting a telehealth practice covers them all. We do have a mini course in there on marketing to get you started, but it's not, it's nothing like the marketing intensive. So step-by-step -step is eight weeks long. You get pre-recorded content that comes to you weekly. And then we meet, so I changed this recently. We meet once a month. This is included in the cost for Q and A's. And I used to meet weekly during the course and then not at all for the rest of the year. And people were like, we need help longer. <laughs> so instead of meeting weekly, when people are really kind of like, dang, I'm just like getting into the content. I don't even have questions yet. We meet once a month and um, I do that 10 months out of the year. So here for you for the lifetime of the course to answer questions. So you are buying lifetime access to the course and to these Q and A's. If you want more support than that, then you can level up and have small group coaching. No more than 12 people will be in this group and we will meet the other three weeks of each month in small groups in Zoom. Um, it's, that's super fun for me because I get to know your business inside and out. I get to know you really well. I can offer very tailored feedback to you. So, you know, I have a little bit of a bias, but those spots are limited. There are some left. So if you want that, grab it. Okay. Um, hold on, hold on. And then the difference with the marketing intensive, sorry, I got a little distracted. The marketing intensive is 12 weeks long. We don't cover anything about setting up an online therapy practice. We are only covering marketing from day one. And we use a very specific framework that works for not just your city or county, but the entirety of your state and any other states or countries that you want to practice in. So that's very different than most marketing courses who are either going to focus on social media, which is a real pain in the butt way to market your practice if that's the only route that you're going, or they focus on SEO only. And the way that they're able to give you success with SEO, because SEO is expensive and it's time consuming, they narrow the scope. So for example, they wouldn't say... Um, your website wouldn't bring in people for women with anxiety in their 40s, right? BetterHelp is already paying all the money that there is to be able to have the SEO point to them for that question. Instead, they're narrowing it to um, women with anxiety in their 40s in um, New Smyrna, Florida. 
right? They have to get really specific geographically for you to afford that SEO and to be able to make some traction. So what I teach you is a way to use SEO content marketing and relationship building to move beyond the scope of just your city or your county. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Kat says, what if you need both, but can't afford both at this time? You like emotionally can't afford both at the same time. You do not want to do both of these courses at the same time. Um, Kat, I would like to know what setup questions you have to know if you really need step-by-step -step or the marketing might be the better choice for you. Um, of the two, I find it much easier to self-teach how to set up a telehealth practice. I mean, even using these videos, the marketing is just, a, it's a more complicated beast. And so if I had to pick between the two, I would pick the marketing one because that's harder information to find for therapists. Whereas setting up a telehealth practice is a little bit easier to find that information on your own. So if I had to pick, I would probably pick the intensive. Um, and there's a little shortcut you could do, Kat. Uh, <laughs> my paranoia is saying step-by-step, step, but my gut is saying marketing. You know what you could do, Kat, is um, I have my informed consent up on my website. It's a hundred bucks. And it's 10 pages long. And as I mentioned, your informed consent is just about all of your policies and procedures. So if you want to grab that to help with your paranoia and then do the marketing intensive, that might make you feel a little bit better. Let me know. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I am running both of these uh, programs at the same time. Jen says, are you running them at the same time? Will this impact access to you? If we select the marketing intensive VIP, that's a lot for you to do. Well, all of the lessons are already written. Uh, so when it comes to the teaching, I mean, in my dream world, I pre-record the marketing intensive stuff this time around. I don't know if that's going to happen. I might still teach live, but in any case, the lessons are already done for all of them. So I don't have to build anything. That's very sweet of you to check in on me. And I limit the number of people. So I cannot <laughs> step-by-step as an anxiety tamer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I can't do unlimited VIP, right? That's why I limit the number of people who can purchase it because the asset reviews take me 20 to 30 minutes. I'm on Voxer really frequently talking to you individually. So we cap the number of people that we bring into uh, the VIP for step-by-step -step is kept at 12. The, uh, well, I guess it's called level up. The, a level up for step-by-step -step is capped at 12. And then with VIP, usually that's capped around 12 too, just depends. Okay, Keisha, I see your question. Hmm. Okay. Do, 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 do. Uh, can you Facebook message me, Keisha? Because I don't even know how to share my phone number with you on here without sharing it. Oh no, here I got it. Hey, hey, hey. Then one nine nine. So I say it out loud. Silly Willie. Okay, Keisha, I just sent you my phone number so you can text me. <laughs> Not the smartest cookie in the back. What are the questions do you have? I'm happy to answer them for you. Okay, awesome, awesome. I want to show you just one more slide as you're trying to make the decision um, between getting the standard package with either one of the course or going with Level Up or VIP. I did a little tricky trickiness, which is I spread the payments out for the upgrades over 12 months even though the course for step-by-step -step is eight weeks and the course for the marketing intensive is 12 weeks, because I really wanted, if you wanted that and you're like, that's what I need for success, I wanted it to be easier for you to do that. So you'll notice that if you do standard step-by-step, -step, you're paying 233 a month if you're gonna break it out in payments, but you're paying 212 a month if you level up. And that is only because we've broken the payments out over a longer period of time. Okay. So it's just, it, it makes it for confusing communication, but it also makes it for very flexible payment arrangements, you know, either go with saving as much money as you can, or go with getting as much support as you can, whatever option works for you, we're happy to do. And we did the same kind of breakdown with the marketing intensive. So you'll notice that the marketing intensive with the VIP is less per month, 
but it's more months. All right. If you are like, all right, I don't know if I'm going to take step by step, but I do want to make sure that my ducks are in order. Take a screenshot of this page. And if you can look at your practice and be like, yeah, I got all this, then you'll know that you're good to go and you don't need the course. So doing all things right, maybe making sure you're covering your butt with all your, your legal eagle stuff, making sure you've got your security, privacy, and tech stuff on point. Um, I was doing an annual security review on my practice because, you know, sometimes we like add apps and, you know, we change things and we don't always revisit. So that's built into the course as well. Every piece of paperwork you could possibly need for your practice is in the course, unless I've linked to like the good faith estimate, I've linked that for you. So I did not build that. I linked it to your professional bodies because they have a lot more money than I have to have that approved by a lawyer. Everything else is in there. You need a biopsychosocial to do your intakes. It's in there. You need scripts to talk to your clients because you're leaving insurance panels. It's in there. You need to tell them that you're increasing your rates. Script is in there. If you need to get off one insurance panel, but you're staying on the rest and you don't know how to do that, we cover that in the course. So all of those details are in there. Your policies and procedures security, make sure you have that set up, clinical risk assessment, please, 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 please think this through ahead of time. Um, I had a client who was in China when I was seeing her and there wasn't the same mental health system and support there as there would be here. So if she became suicidal. It wasn't that she would be taken to a mental health facility. She could be taken somewhere well, I'm not going to get into the details. At any rate, it was not the same as here. And so we had to come up with like very, very specific plans before I would bring her on board as a client. And I really put the onus on her. I was like, here are the things that I'm going to need to feel like we can proceed and you can get the support you need from me. And she did the legwork and she found out like, okay, what's an international crisis line I could use? Okay. You know, who can I call for support? That's local. Who's not going to like get me in trouble, that kind of stuff. Um, we talked through details of creating clinical connection via video. Uh, I even have, because I'm silly, a little mini course on how to do makeup for video so that you actually look like yourself. I don't know if y'all have noticed, but sometimes you get on video and you're like, that is not how I look. It is because the light is flattening everything out on your face. And so there are some little tricks and hacks. I was literally in my pajamas and highly motivated to answer a question in the group. So I just threw it in there. I've already introduced you to Shayla, um, so I'm going to skip that part. I'm going to skip that part. Here's just a recap of the uh, payment plans, but this is what I really want you to see. So this is Jamie Howard, and uh, she had an interesting trajectory. So she's like, I'm in an agency, but I ultimately want to have a hybrid physical practice, but I don't have the cash to be paying for rent, office space, furniture, all the liability insurance. I want to build an online practice first, get myself situated financially, and then open up the physical part of my practice, which I thought was freaking brilliant. Now she has an equine assisted physical practice with hybrid online stuff. And um, I believe the last we checked, I think she is mostly private pay with the exception of the work she does with military personnel, which goes through insurance. So, and she's built time for passive income or family time. I mean, just, and she says, this is the happiest I've been in two years. So whether or not you do the course is not really, I mean, obviously like I would like to make a living, but whether or not you do the course is really not the biggest issue here. I just want to make sure that you have what you need to proceed into an online practice or marketing to private pay clients if that's the next step to you getting closer to the life that you want to live. So any other questions that you might have, I don't care what it's about, that might help you get closer to living the life that you want to live and keep doing the work you love doing with clients. Yep. Okay, uh, Victoria says, I'm interested in your momentum program. Do you have the link? I sure do. I'll drop it for you right here. Momentum is for those folks who are already seeing private pay clients. You've got a foundation in marketing, but 
you need to increase your rate and you need some support in doing that. You want to let go of some insurance panels or all of them. And you're looking to create some space either to live more or to start thinking about a side hustle. Momentum is the mastermind for that. And um, it's invitation only. It's a small group. So you do need to fill out that little form to let me know that you're interested. I'm so glad that the trainings have been good. I will see you all on Thursday. We're talking all about marketing. Make sure that you use your coupon code if you're purchasing. And if you are a former stepper, remember you can save an additional 500 smackers on the intensive. So email me if you do not have that code and I will get it for you. All right, my friends, take good care. I will talk to you soon. Bye now.